We've got Tristan Vidas alongside him on the front row of the grid is Alex Capardia. And then the inside of row two, Marco Cencetti, who was saying after qualifying that he was having a few problems with overheating brakes, which is probably going to be a theme over the course of this race, as is the management of tyres. It's Chris Hyman who is starting. There is Alex Mortimer just outside the car. Former, former Paul Rowdy racer Hyman giving the thumbs up. And then Bradley Smith, who comes into this weekend second in the championship behind Vidas, lines up in fifth. He has incurred a four-place grid penalty after any discretion last time out on the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit. Alongside him on the third row of the grid is Christian Cronengard. Cronengard taking a opportunity to get a last little bit of shade underneath the, uh, the Donald umbrella in the Mark's electrical car. Then it's Constantine Calco who is lining up in seventh. Thumbs up from him. The sun absolutely beating down here. The, the temperature, though, because we've got quite a nice breeze, actually isn't as high as was originally predicted, although we are still just about nudging 30 degrees centigrade. There's Manhal Alos, one of the more effervescent characters of the radical European masters. A, a large and enthusiastic crowd have been here since the, the track action got underway very first thing this morning, and this is the first race of the day, and here is how they line up. So the front row of the grid, Vidas and Capaldia, row two, Marco Cencetti and Chris Hyman, row three, Bradley Smith and Christian Grollengard, then it's Constantine Calco and Manhalalos, Tony James Littlejohn and Terence Woodward, and then Yap Bartles and Jamie Constable completing the next row, Alan Costa and Mike Cantillon, then it is Tony Ford, James Abbott, Joseph Collar, Thomas Motorgap and Jean Gandar completing the 19 car field and there's not that many drivers because a lot of drivers come through radical racing go on to the, the likes of LMP2, LMP1 racing there's not that many veterans on the field who were here last time the radicals raced at Hungara Ring no, there aren't, although um, we've seen lap times tumble throughout the weekend and in fact the, uh, the fastest time that Bradley set this morning was, was some 3.0 seconds faster than the last SR8 lap last time we came, so it's quite a lot quicker than it was last time and, and the competition at the front end is, is really hot because there's only six points in it at the head of the championship. So to explain, there's two types of car that we're going to be seeing in this race. There is the Radical SR8, which is the V8 car, absolutely spectacular machine and then the Radical SR3, the super sport car as well. They eat, are each racing for overall race honours but also they have their own classes and class podiums as well. The race is a 50 minute race. There is the mandatory pit stop that will come or the window will open at the 23rd minute into the race and that is when things can get turned on the head because one of the nice things well, about these Radical European Masters races is that you almost get two races in one. You get the early scrapping, the pit stops work themselves through, and then you get the, the chasing and closing down the gaps through to the chequered flag. Yes, with the slight change this year in the regulations in that the two-car teams, pro-am teams, can, can pick whoever starts which race and whoever qualifies in any order. So we've had several times this year where we've had occasions where drivers have found themselves out of position, maybe... Uh, a good way down the field and have had to fight the way back through and, and similarly drivers that are, are less experienced are sort of coming under pressure from the, the professionals so it's sort of bringing everybody's game up and it, it guarantees some really thrilling racing especially in the closing stages of the race. We'll look forward to how things unfold. This is the last opportunity for the drivers to get a little bit of a feel for the conditions here at Hungara in this afternoon. It will then of course be into a rolling start. So we've got a very steep downhill turn one that then leads on to turns two and three officially speaking this is turn three before you then have the, the quick right hand of flick downhill into turn four and the sprint on towards turns five and six and, and you're right well this is, is a somewhat unusual circuit in that when it, when it was open back in the, the mid 1980s uh, first host of the hungarian grand prix in 1987 the, the drivers found it it was tighter than they expected it's still quite a tight technical circuit, but actually very different in nature to, to some of the modern circuits that we see designed by the likes of Herm Tilke. Yes, and, and a lot of the drivers that have come over from the United Kingdom compare it to uh, some of the classic circuits such as Hilton Park and Cadwell Park in that it's, it's quite technical in nature. There's some very heavy braking zones and uh, tyre management, I think, is going to be crucial through the race because the temperatures are quite high um, and the areas, you know, there's long, long corners that place a lot of load on the tyre. So what we saw in qualifying is that quite a few of the drivers would put in early laps and really push quite hard early on in the qualifying get a good lap in and then 
um, effectively park and conserve the tyres so they can have the best chance this afternoon. Yeah, tyre wear is is always an issue here, even if it if it's a little bit cooler than, than this. It's a lovely situation for the circuit as well because it, it fits into a natural bowl and amphitheatre, which you don't quite get get a sense of maybe from some of the television angles. But it, it does mean that it offers some fantastic vantage points for spectators as well. Well worth making the trip over here if you ever get the opportunity to enjoy some action at the Hungara Ring. So the formation lap beginning to come to a conclusion. They're beginning to form up side by side behind the pace car. It's the silver car of the Estonian driver Tristan Vidas to the inside of the all-black car of Alex Capaldi. And that's the black and red car of Marco Cianchetti and the all-red machine of Chris Hyman. Then it's the white, black and red car of Bradley Smith and the blue and black car of Christian Kronengard. You would expect that it will be one of those six that will be to the fore of the field as they charge down towards the first turn. So they're climbing uphill now through turn 15 onto the last corner, turn 16. It's going to be the responsibility then of Vidas to pace the field. Let's hope they make a clean getaway and hope they make it cleanly through the first corner as well because it is a very tight, very heavy braking zone. Field looks absolutely magnificent in the Central European sun as we're about to go racing at the Hungaro Ring for the fifth time in 2014 in the Radical European Masters. Away they go, sprinting towards turn one. A little bit of debris behind it, an incident. Around goes James Littlejohn in the Mark's electrical car as Chris Hyman looks to challenge the outside into turn one. It's very, very tight. They all jostle for position. Tristan Vidas, though, leads the way. Marco Cencetti is in second place. It's Bradley Smith who's in third. Christian Kronengard in fourth. And Chris Hyman has lost out. He has been shuffled long the way down through the field. Yeah, Chris celebrating his, his birthday today, but obviously didn't have the best of luck there, got, uh, got walked in the middle of the field and uh, and obviously Helen had to, to break to, to avoid the uh, the resultant Mark's electrical contact there as well. So I get, get a little bit of a view as to what happened and the safety car has come out. So a full course yellow, that, and that would be to recover the stricken car of James Littlejohn. It is, we believe, at the wheel of the number two car who, who got turned around was was very fortunate not to be collected by others and so almost as soon as the race is there is little john yeah little john getting out of the car there already glad to see that he is okay uh, yes this being an fia series of course all of all of the cars have to meet those very very high level of, of fia crash testing and safety and uh, that's that's paramount really Unfortunately, although he got turned around like that and clearly can't continue, I don't think the car is particularly badly damaged. Here we see it again, and they all moved across to the inside. There was some debris that went flying, and then it was Manhal Alos who made contact with Little John. We couldn't quite see what caused the squeeze, but it was Little John who lost out. Here we see it again. Yeah, Alos tagged by the, the pink car as well. Yes, I think there was just the briefest contact there with, uh, with Contantins. Um, to uh, contact there actually outside the car, so that must be uh, his, uh, his driving partner, Hezus Fuster. Okay, so yeah, it, it was it was Alos, Fuster, and Little John basically trying to squeeze three radicals into a space that was only two radicals wide. And unfortunately, James Little John is the victim in that. The right call from Brian Coulter, Coulter, the clerk of the course and race director, to scramble the safety car, and it should be a fairly brief intervention here behind the safety car because. The incident has already been recovered. They come through, then to complete the first lap. It's Tristan Vidas who leads the way. Marco Cincetti is in second place. Bradley Smith, third. Christian Krongard in fourth. Alex Capardia rather losing out in the first lap. He slips down to fifth. Yeah, Bartles, conversely, has gained somewhat. He is up into sixth, just ahead of Jamie Constable and Terence Woodward. Chris Hyman dropped all the way down to 12th place. As we do indeed get the notification, the safety car's in this lap. Let's hope they behave this time around then. Though it's, uh, it's a very clean series generally in terms of driving standards. There was certainly no malice in that incident. It was just a case of all the drivers looking for the optimal positioning on the brakes into turn one. And Littleton unfortunately just being left without quite enough space. Whether or not he will return later in the race remains to be seen. One of the challenges of that first corner 
here at the Hungara Ring is that it's not only is it incredibly tight, but it's also quite steeply downhill as well. So judging your braking point on the first lap is, is incredibly difficult here. And it, it, exactly as we saw as well, the Nurbo break at the very start of the season. It's quite some calendar, by the way, the Radical European Masters cars have because they start off with the Nurbo ring, then it was the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit. We're here at the Hungaro ring. Then we have got the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, then Spa, Monza and, and Catalonia. Yeah, some great classic Grand Prix circuits on there. And uh, it's great because it gives, gives the SR8 uh, the chance to stretch their legs um, on a sort of full international um, sort of stadium. Yeah, a, a, a great calendar there for the SR8s. And for the guys that are sort of making their way up through the Radical Ladder, it's, it's a great proving ground for the SR3 as well. It gives you a chance to, to get a flavour of, of real international sports cars. And with the likes of Alex Capaldi, who are looking to move on to European Le Mans Series time racing in 24 hours, to demonstrate the ability to race a win on these circuits is very important for attracting the eye of teams throughout the most important So, the safety car hills in, we're about to go racing, and Tristan Vidas has immediately got Marco Cencetti trying to close onto his tail, but Vidas has judged that restart very nicely. As the Estonian driver propels himself down the start and finish straight in heavy braking zone for turn one. Bradley Smith looks at the inside of Cencetti. Capardia doing much the same to Cronin Garden. Alex Capardia tight on the brakes. It gives Jack Bartles the opportunity to look to the outside. Jamie Constable trying to sneak through to the inside. And that's exactly the point you were making, Will, about the, the challenge of finding that right, right braking point. Yes, yeah, it looks like Bradley's uh, already closed up to the back of Cencetti. Cencetti, one of the few drivers, as you said earlier, on the, on the grid here that, that has been to the Hungarian and raced here before. In fact, he, he held the, uh, the SR3 lap record coming under pressure now from the, the young SR3 Challenge champion. Bradley Smith, who has spent his entire career in radicals, earned more often than not spent in the very, very front of, of the, the pack. Uh, and I think the, the success that Bradley Smith has had winning the Snow Coat Daytona Challenge shows how how effective this radical race lab is. Yeah, there's a complete ladder that takes people out, out of track days, gives them all the training they need in the SR1 Cup. Um, the Clubman's Cup, which is a, a long-standing domestic sport series in the UK, is, is a great place for, for clubmen and, and, and gentlemen drivers to uh, sort of cut their teeth in sprint racing and, and get used to our full cylinder cars. Um, and then you can move through up to the, the really hotly contested SR3 Challenge, which is a, a spec formula um, and is very, very competitive. There's some, some real leading UK and, and European sports car stars in there um, before migrating to, to the uh, European Masters. And, and as you mentioned, you know, to then move into international competition. Uh, Bradley competed at Daytona 24 hours this year. Um, as you say, Capadia in European Le Mans, uh, Little Gun and, and Tony Wells the same. So um, it's a great breeding ground for, for sports car and endurance racing talent. Well, the real battle at the moment is the one between Manuel Alos. He has got Alan Costa just tucked in behind him as Marco Cencetti attempts the on terms with our race leader, Tristan Vidas. So there is Alos. He has got that cue behind him, Alan Costa darts to the inside and jinks through, gains the place. Oh, and then spins it away. A little bit too tight on the brakes. Uh, that will cost him a lot of places as he rejoins right at the rear of the field behind Joseph Collar. A little bit over exhibition there from the Monegasque. It's a disappointment there for Costa. And he's certainly got the pace. Feeling feisty as Alos pulls off in the background. And just before we had that spin for Alan Costa, I was going to, and here we see it again. Incredibly late on the brakes, turns across, and suddenly the rear wing has just not got enough traction. Here, here we see Fralos. I just wonder whether or not he's carrying a little bit of damage from that, that pre first corner incident with James Littlejohn. Yes, possibly looks like he's got a puncher there as well, maybe. Meanwhile, at the front, Vidas and Cencetti setting the pace from Bradley Smith, Christian Kronengard, and then Alex Capadia. Capadia coming into this weekend on the back of a very successful weekend on the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit where he and co-driver Tom Jordan scored two third places. The race wins at Brands Hatch, by the way, by the way of Chris Hyman, partnered by Robbie Kerr. And there's quite a good story behind that we'll go into later in the race. And then the second race was won by this man, Bradley Smith. And one of the things that's so impressive about Bradley, Will, is, is the way that he's really able to manage his pace throughout the, the entire course of the race so that he is there when it matters at the end. 
That's right, yes, and, and that's what endurance racing is all about, these 50-minute these radical European Masters races. It's, it's not simply going as fast as you can to the flank. There's a, a lot to think about, a lot of, uh, sort of intelligent driving to be, you know, both in, in conserving your tyres, um, conserving brakes, um, and, and in a heat like this, conserving yourself as well. It takes a, a huge physical toll on the body in these temperatures and, and the G-forces. So, um, you know, he, he obviously trains very, very hard, a great level of fitness to, to ensure that he can get to the, the finish and really push at the end. Brilliant move there from Alex Capadia on Christian Krollengard. He, he hung on around the outside, gave himself the inside line in turn four. Now, Kang Capadia set fair and chased down Bradley Smith on Christian Krollengard. Car back of him. Krollengard, a former radical Sweden champion, former runner up as well with the radical European Masters. Alex Capadia has had a huge array of success throughout the course of his motorsport career. Vidas, we get a notification of the race leader who's set the fastest lap. That is no particular surprise. So can Capadia ease clear in fourth? But he's had a reasonably good middle sector to this lap. Does Capadia offer up? It was like a 39-0 as opposed to a 39-5 for Christian Krollengard. There's an added element as well because once we get to the, uh, the pit stops, even if they maintain this gap, um, because of the success section system with the pit stops in, in the Radical European Masters, uh, at the moment Alex and his, his co-driver Tom are actually carrying an extra 10 seconds on their pit stop time from Krollengard. So it could be an opportunity for him to leap, uh, leap from the pair in the, the pit stops. Lovely super slow motion shot into the visor of Christian Krollengard, fully focused and concentrating on the car in front. So 20% race distance, five laps consigned to the history books. Tristan Vidas leading it. Marco Cenchetti and Bradley Smith. We're currently watching the fight for seventh place. It's the red and black car of Jamie Constable. He's ahead of the black and blue car of Terence Woodward. Through turn two into turn three, then this downhill left hander. Uh, uh, and the real challenge for, for a lot of these turns with this, they're either just very gently going downhill or uphill. It, it, it makes the, the braking quite hard to judge. Yes, and, and a lot of them are 180 degree long hairpins as well. So, um, judging the sort of it's, it's a real balancing act for not just radicals but for any car, getting the optimum line with a lot of these. The, the, Entry changes the the, the tightness of, of the corner changes as you as you enter enter and exit it. So um, it, it, it's different from a lot of circuits in many ways because you haven't got sort of short corners. A lot of these you're you're hanging on, feeling the grip of three, four, five, maybe even longer than that seconds. It's an immensely enjoyable circuit to drive on, as much as anything. A couple of years ago, when GT Open were last here, I went out one evening in the hire car just to drive a couple of very slow laps, and it, it really. I think that the comparison for, for anybody watching the UK with somewhere like Alton Park or Cadwell Park is very apt in terms of the flow and the rhythm that you need for a good lap time. And it, it makes such a stunning background as well. And the, the natural greenery in and around the circuit, the, uh, the hills, hills and the, the just the, as you say, the natural amphitheatre, uh, just as we... Oh, oh dear. Jean Gondar having a, a slide back across the, uh, the runoff there. Well, the brakes are working. He recovered that very, very nicely. That is going to see him probably slipping down to seventh or thereabouts. It's Terence Woodward coming back at Jamie Constable. I just wonder whether Jamie is carrying a little bit more rear wing here because he, he seems to be much quicker through the, the middle section of the circuit moving through Terence Woodward. Woodward then closes up along the straights. Constable. It's about to arrive at the scene of Jean Gandar's incident. Oh, that's a real shame there. Gandar is still stranded. So he has lost the engine as the battle for the lead continues and he is closing up a bit. Marco Cenchetti, former Italian prototype championship racer, before moving on to racing radicals in the European Masters, closing up. He's fractionally over a second adrift of Vidas. They have got Bradley Smith trying to close in on them. Cenchetti setting the best first sector of anybody in the race thus far. Tristan Vidas, though, able to absorb at the moment. Cenchetti can throw at him. Now, in terms of handicap, well, Vidas is carrying none into the pit stops. Cenchetti, when he hands over to Marcio Maratiotto, is 
carrying some additional success handicap. So, therefore, the, the task for Cencetti is to get past Vidas and then try and pull clear. Yeah, and um, from what, yeah, what, what we've what we've seen in the short time that the Vidas has been competing in radicals is that he is um, just as just as Bradley Smith has, has done in the SR3 Challenge last year. He's supremely good over the the whole of the race. So his his pace is is maintained right to the end. You don't really see a drop off in performance. So um, I can see him probably sort of slowly slowly turning up screw just as little than ever. Really. Well, they are beginning to swoop on downhill at the moment. With just sliding the rear of his car there, Marco Cencetti looking to apply the pressure to Vidas because Trust to Vidas is going to go the whole distance single handedly. Cencetti will hand over, meanwhile, mid race to Marcel Maratayotto. So they go past the double wave jello flags for the recovery of Jean Gandar, which is near enough completed. And with all due respect to Maratayotto, he's not quite at the same level of pace. Marco Cencetti. No, and Marco needs to be careful to conserve those rear tyres as well. He doesn't want to slide the car around too much, otherwise you're going to find in the, the latter stages, once Maratotto is in the car, that it'll start to slide around even more and the, the lap time's going to drop off. Yeah, I think he'll be buying dinner tonight, won't he? He'll be absolutely cooked to those tunnels before the mid-race pit stops. But part of the challenge that Cencetti has got is that because these cars are essentially six wing sport prototypes, once you get into the territory of the car in front, you begin to get to the into the turbulent air, and that's when understeer starts to become an issue. That's when you start overworking the tyres. Yes, the downforce on the, the SR3 and the SR8 starts to, to act from quite a low speed. So, 45, 50 miles an hour, you start to feel the, uh, particularly the front end air, really start to take effect, and the, the underfloor venturis and the aerodynamics start to pull the car down onto the ground. In fact, the, the underfloor, the underneath of the car, provides the majority of the downforce. The rear wing um, is significant, but, but doesn't produce as much as that, that underbody aero. Uh, and I'd say if you ever get a chance to take a radical uh, on, on a track day, do so because firstly you'll have an immensely good time, but secondly, driving any sort of car with that level of mechanical aerodynamic grip, it's like nothing else you've ever experienced in terms of you just put the car into the corner and, and it sticks. Yeah, you've got the, the fastest drivers find that they can just let the car do the work. So um, you know, the, the quickest way is, is to keep the car smooth, uh, minimal steering input, really let the car do the work. Um, and, and around a circuit such as such as the Hangero ring here, um, that's a, you know, a really effective strategy because um, you're placing minimal loads on the tyres. You're you're just really using that suspension and the, the massive massive um, underbody aero to, to work the car. But as you say, as soon as you uh, we're just watching here, is, is Terence is going to make it stick around the first corner? Yep, just shuts the door on. Uh, Constable, yes, he's made that stick. That, that was an absolutely perfect block pass there from Terence Wood. He got to the inside and just got the car stopped so that Jamie Constable couldn't go for the switch back. It means that Mike Cantalon as well has joined in. Yes, we've got three 360 teammates here and, and Constable and Cantalon really, really good friends from uh, from the days of, of Vida V and, and Speed Euro Series and uh, various other international sports car championships as well. So, um, as, oh, as Chen Chetty takes a very wide line there. Yeah, he'll have a pretty tough job explaining that he stayed within the track limits for that one. So we're enjoying the battle then for 7th, 8th and 9th place. Terence Woodward to the fore of it at the moment, ahead of Jamie Constable. Constable, the former Caterham Euro Cup champion, going back uh, a decade or so ago. As we've got another driver who is in trouble. That looks like that's Cencetti out the car. It is. And big lock up there, and, and oh, ooh, that's big impact as well. Glad to see Cencetti walking away from that. That's not going to polish it out, is it? No, no. but uh, obviously very pleased to see him out of the car quickly and uh, and over the barriers to safety. You see, that is uh, that is quite interesting the way that that unfolded there as, as we followed Thomas Meidegger because. We've been saying for the past couple of laps, he's got to be careful. He seems to be really pushing the limits and uh, an overstep them. Fortunately, the tyre barrier is doing exactly what they're supposed to do. More importantly, the safety structures on the Radical SR8 are doing exactly what it was supposed to do. With with Bradley Smith out of the uh, the dirty air, as it were, of, of Cencetti now, it'll be interesting to see whether or not his lap time improves as he uh, takes up the chase to Vidas. So Bradley Smith currently five seconds back from Tristan Vidas. Vidas swooping his way out on 
towards turns 12 and 13, which is where Cencetti came a very distant second in his disagreement with the tyre wall. I suspect that's going to rather tax the ability of well, as well of their of the spare parts they can source, because I hope there's no chassis damage. There are enough bits and pieces to get Cencetti Maritato back tomorrow. Meanwhile, Cantalog and Constable having a, a very nice scrap. Terence Woodward's rock when they're being caught by Chris Hyman. Yeah, on that last lap, there was just a second between the between the pair, and uh, it, yeah, Chris Chris is, is getting very very uh, he's getting back into the fight as well after a, a difficult start, obviously being uh, trapped sort of in the middle of the melee on the on the first start. But my maths suggests that Chris Hyman is 51 today, but clearly my maths are wrong because he looks so much younger than that. <laughs> He, he must use a lot of products. <laughs> he, 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 he no, he's he's, uh, he, he's one of the drivers that, that takes fitness very, very. Uh, you know, it, it's very, very crucial, obviously. You know, essential when you're driving a, a car with the, the power and, and performance of an SR8. So uh, I know he has a very rigid fitness regime. Uh, Chris has always impressed me ever since his his former partner Audi is not into British GT Championship racing because although he is what you classify as a gentleman driver, he's in fact an incredibly successful businessman. But, but, but he applies that focus that he takes to his day job, to his racing in terms of the fitness, in terms of, of the approach and rigour and discipline to, to get in the car to work it as well as it can. Yes, and, and racing with Alex Mortal Girls, former British GT champion, they've, they've worked together a, a, as a pairing for a very long time. They, they sort of they understand what, what they can do to motivate each other and, and how to get the best out of the car and, and, and the package that they have as a pairing. So one of the other great things about Chris as well is he's very, very good at maintaining and dictating the pace during the race. So um, he, he won't simply drive as fast as he can. He's very good at, at knowing when to, when to set a fast lap, when to push and, and when to back off and conserve tyres and play the long game. Well, what's quite interesting uh, thus far on this lap is that Chris Hyman is taking different lights in some of the turns, as if he's trying to get out of the dirty air behind Mike Cantor. Yes, yeah, I'm just looking here as well. The uh, pit lane has just opened this minute, so um, we should start to see the first of the drivers coming in the pit stops for their driver changes. I wonder if uh, Chris will be in reasonably early here. Very nice livery on that car as well. Uh, and, and particularly full marks to the car a little bit further down the order. Hopefully we'll see it later, which is in the livery of a 1977 Ferrari. Yes, yeah, we've got both a, a modern version and uh, something very re reminiscent of the, uh, the great 312 Ferrari um, of the mid-70s. So, uh, yeah, no, the, there's some, some really bright and vibrant uh, displays on it. You just see uh, Corona Guard there jumping over the chicane. The, the bright, distinctive day glow strips on the rear wings, they denote the SR8, so it's quite a, an easy identifier to, to tell which of the 8s and the 3s. And, and in particular, I think that's so effective uh, as and when you, you get into traffic, potentially later in the race. Yes, yeah, it's the first thing you see in your mirrors when you're, you're full of these, these bright day glow strips on, on either side, you know, uh, as a 3 driver, it's maybe time to, to look to move over. So we are rapidly approaching half race distance here. We've got 28 and a half minutes left on the clock. The pit window is open. And really, for this man, the race leader, Tristan Vidas, it, it is a complete luxury for him as to when he ducks into pits in second place at the moment, then it is Bradley Smith. Third is Alex Capadia. Fourth, Christian Cronengard. Fifth is Jack Bartels. And sixth, Terence Woodward. The super sport class is currently being led by Tony Fawn from Thomas Meidinger and Phil Abbott. Yeah, Phil, Phil uh, started as, as second in that class, but it looks like uh, Thomas, a, a very, very experienced radical racer, um, back from the days of the SR5, has, uh, has found his way back up to, uh, to second. But there's, there's not a huge amount in it. As Vidas comes into pit, he's the first one in. And he very nearly overcooked that. He was right up against the curbs on the way in. He then gets down to the 60 kilometer an hour pit lane speed limit which for the drivers feels agonisingly slow. If you're a pedestrian, it feels plenty fast enough. Also in has come Bradley Smith. So that promotes then into the race lead, Alex Capadia. And Capadia. An illustrious career in motorsport behind him. Also, again, a very successful businessman outside the car. Uh, and he and Tom Jordan, over the past couple of seasons, formed a really effective driver partnership. They seem to work very well together. Um, Tom Jordan came into uh, the SR3 Challenge with, with relatively little racing experience. He'd, he'd, he'd kart race, but, but not a huge amount of, of otherwise sports car racing experience. So um, Alex has taken him under, wing and, uh, under his wing, and, and yeah, they've developed into a great partnership, very, very, very successful. And really, it's been, it's been quite fantastic.
fantastic to see how quickly Thomas has come on. We, uh, we just see some tyre pressure checks and uh, adjustments made there by Bradley Smith crew. So Chris on Sam the car to go up there with Cabot's birthday cake. Alex Mortimer then about to jump in. Scuderia Radical says the sticker, I like that. Yeah, and already Vidas is, is making his way out the pit exit. Uh, looks like a nice clean stop for him. And because he came into this race without any of, of that, that pit lane success handicap, it, it really does give him every opportunity if he can maintain this pace to come through and score his first victory since the Nürburgring at the start of the year. Yeah, that's right. As long as he's, he's played it over right um, in terms of his timing with the pit exit and he doesn't get trapped by too much traffic in the middle of this pit stop window, um, then he, he should be a pretty good shout for the race win, I'm sure. So, Father Phil clambers out, son James jumps in. James, another driver having a very busy season alongside his British Formula Ford Championship campaign, which is going pretty well. He took some opportunity to get out in radical car whenever he gets the opportunity. As Vidas, not our race leader, but by the time these pit stops have worked themselves through, he's going to be reasonably confident, I would suggest, of having a nice advantage. Yeah, it's not always easy during the pit stop window to ascertain exactly who's who's on track position and, and, and where they're leading. But um, I would guess with, with all of these pit stops have been completed later in the race, um, he should have a fairly commanding lead, having uh, no penalty at all. So we have got the, the bulk of the field now has either made or is in the process of making their pit stop. Here is the race leader, though, Alex Capardia, and I, I suspect with a bit of clear air and no traffic, Alex will be inclined, as will the slip racing team that run the car, to keep him out there for, for as long as they can. Maybe even think about being able to get a jump on Bradley Smith. That's really what the target will be. As Mike Cantillon gets a brief wipe of his visor. The other driver that could come into play here as well is Christian Kronigord, of course, driving solo. Um, he really made his mark on, on Radical European Masters a couple of seasons ago um, at the final round in Barcelona, where he drives from the back of the grid to the win. So um, on the right day, his, his pace is staggering. And again, he's, he's not carrying any success seconds. So really, he could be Vidas's his, his closest container in the final stages of the race. The, the trouble he's got is that the Vidas ducks into the pitch probably about 12 seconds ahead of him as going on then for another lap is going to be Alex Capadia. So Capadia continues on with Alex Mortimer and Christian Cronengard do battle. And Cronengard putting the lap on Mortimer, of course, because of the way that the pit stops have worked out. It's not a particularly bad car for Mortimer to follow, at least for the next couple of laps. So we've come back to Capadia there. I just wonder if something has split off the turn one, yeah. Find out in due course. Looks like that was probably Cantillon just out breaking himself momentarily. It's Michael Schumacher, isn't it? Back in 1993, who had a rear wing fade as he emerged from a pit stop here at the, uh, the Hungara Ring. That same year, Estoril Gerhard Berger parked the car in the, the Onco Barrier when he emerged from, from the pits. It's easily done. There's not a huge amount of here, right? There's only a couple of stages where there are there rough tracks. The, Concrete aprons run off quite big, but uh, elsewhere on the circuit, there's not a huge amount of grass, so um, you know, you've got to be really tight and tidy and, and keep all four wheels on the back stuff. And that is exactly what Capadia is doing at the moment. 23 minutes left in the race. We are, are set, I think, for a really thrilling finale, if, if not perhaps for the race victory, because that is going to look reasonably good for Tristan Vidas, then certainly for the other spots on the podium. Capadia dancing on that razor's edge on the limit of adhesion because what you always find with these cars that run on slick tires that have high levels of aerodynamic grip is they have all the grip in the world and so they have absolutely none at all uh, and the key for these pro drivers is to dance right on that limit. Yes, yeah, you want to be at that point where you can just start to feel, oh, the Ross Kaiser are in trouble. Yeah, that's an uncharacteristic error there from, from Ross, actually, to run wide. He's, uh, again, a, a real stalwart of radical racing, came up from the, the really hotly contested by Joro Cup in the, the mid-noughties, and uh, uh, he's a former UK UK Cup champion, a former European champion. So that's that's not the kind of thing we normally see from Ross. Unless maybe he was just moving aside to allow Capadia through with, with the blue flags. Yeah, that's quite possible. It's the, they, they have a great friendship, obviously, again, Alex and... Uh, have been around in the paddock for, for a long time, real good mutual friends. So. Ross Kaiser, 
Mark Netsik actually turned 32 years old. And he and Terence Wilbur can find themselves actually within a with a good chance of snatching a podium from today's race because Terence made good progress once he'd raced himself through that traffic. They were carrying no success handicap. Uh, and Ross, quick driver, 2012 Rather Cool European Masters champion alongside Terence Woodward. He's out on the furthest extremity of the circuit. He'll pit in. For, for reference, by the way, Capadia's last lap was 1 minute 46.4. And what was Tristan Vidas doing? A 1 minute 45.7. Vidas is flying. Yeah, he's got the hammer down right up to the pit lane. He's, he's attacking when he needs to. Um, Alex, it, you know, he'll, he'll be starting to get tired now. Even even the most well-trained and, and most athletic of the, the racers, you know, the fatigue will start in, you know, be starting to creep in now. So... Um, really, this is the, the time for Vidas to attack and, and, and make hope while the sun shines. I, I guess the, the only question mark for, v, for me is Capadia, as if on cue, ducks into the pit lane. The question mark is that Alex has looked incredibly smooth during that stint, and I think he's going to give Tom Jordan the Dunlop tyres in, in pretty good condition. Whereas the pace that Vidas is running at, I just wonder whether or not he's going to encounter a nasty surprise in the last 10 minutes or so. Yes, the, the Dunlop is a, is a really good endurance compound tyre. It's very, very hard wearing. It's, it's been developed specifically for, for the Radical models, so it, it sort of works in harmony with the car. But every tyre has its, has its limits ultimately, and particularly in, in punishing conditions like this, where we have very, very hot conditions and a very abrasive circuit. You know, as in any other endurance racing, the Mon 24 Hours, Daytona, um, uh, 24 hour racing at Spa, um, you, you know, you've, you've got to pay close attention to not overwork the tyres. Um, and Tristan just, he's, he's a very, I mean, not aggressive driver, but he, he obviously is always right, right, right on that limit of adhesion, starting from the car slide, um, and, and whether or not that, again, is, is warming the tyres up, and he, he may find later in, this, in the race that, um, that he hasn't got as much as his, his peers. But whenever I mistakenly think I'm a reasonably intelligent person, I always think about tyre technology and realise that I'm not, because almost the Dunlop technicians are the last remaining alchemists to, to design a, a compound of, of a tyre, which is a, a, basically a chemical formula that, that will do specific things to motor race. It's quite incredible, the technology. Yeah, it, it literally is a black art, really. There's a, a, a huge amount of secrecy in, in tyres and, and racing tyres, particularly the compound construction, um, you know, the internal weaving of the tyre. It's, it's all a very, very closely guarded secret, and, uh, and Dunlop, obviously, have uh, yeah, been doing it longer than anybody else. Well, it's the silver flash, not the green flash, then the Dunlop shot car of Tristan Vidas, who is back into the lead of the race. It's at the end of this lap because the entire field has now made their pit stops. But with 18 minutes to go, we'll be able to give you the post-pit stop order to the race, and more importantly, a sense of where the gaps are and where the challenges are likely to come from. Up front, though, there's no dispute that it is Tristan Vidas who is in command. He is just coming up onto the tail of the 17 car. That's Joseph Collar in the, uh, the 1970s Ferrari liveried SR3. And Collar currently running second in the Super Bowl class to Alvaro Fontes, who still leads the way. Third in the Super Sport class, by the way, is Rustam Akin Azov. Yeah, Rustam is, uh, is, is new to Radical this, this weekend, so this is his race debut. Um, has, has been racing very successfully, podiums wins in the, the Lada Grand Cup in Russia. Um, but it's uh, obviously very different to, to switch to a, a rear, a mid-engine sports car from a, a front-engine touring car. Well, he's out of the Lada and into the oven this weekend because it is really getting very warm here. It's a nice move there from Alex Mortimer. Well, Alain Costa, that was a pass for ninth position. The next target then is Ross Kaiser, who may well on this lap have been demoted by Mike Cantillon. Ind indeed, he has been. So 7th, 8th and 9th and 10th running very closely together. There is Kaiser. Cantillon just ahead of him. So we have a replay of Tom Jordan being passed by Christian Cronengard, and that is the move for second and third position because as they have completed the 17th lap of the race Vidas leads the way he's 20 seconds clear of Christian Collingard in third place it's Tom Jordan in fourth and only two and a half seconds back is Bradley Smith 
And then in fifth, it's Jack Barth, so he isn't too far back either. He's running wide there through the final turn. There's Mike Cantillon. Ross Kaiser goes past him. I just wonder whether Alex Mortimer is going to have a run here along the start and finish straight as Kaiser moves right to the inside of the road and allows both Cantillon and Mortimer past. Yeah, and uh, Mortimer's used that as an opportunity to, to slingshot through, use the, uh, again, use that, the space in the dirty air behind Cantillon's car to, to get a drive and, and made, a pace, uh, made a pass, obviously. Ross realised that was going to happen and got out of the way well in time. Well, that, but Ross was racing for position, I don't quite understand why, why he moved aside like that. Just see a replay here as he... Well, that's Cantillon running yeah, wide. Quite a close line around the apex, so he didn't outbreak himself. Yeah, it was slightly uncharacteristic. I don't know if he had a, a momentary issue there, perhaps, with the car. It, it could be as well that he's concerned about braking temperature and didn't want to get into a brakes battle. Yeah, and, and another one that needs to worry about that then is Yap Bartels, you see there, just with a, a lock-up on the uh, the approach to the Jacquet. Yeah, currently running in fifth and trying to chase down Bradley Smith. Oh, and the fight for thirds come together. Tom Jordan in the black car has been caught by the white, red and black car of Bradley Smith. And this is the battle for the final spot on the race podium. And Smith just flicks the tail of the car. Coming out of turn 16 down the start and finish straight. If you look to use the slipstream and then challenge Tom Jordan to the inside, but it's not close enough on this occasion. I'm not sure if he's going to be, depending on the drive out this corner, whether or not it'll be close enough for the next corner either. So. Um, Tom Jordan can hold on here for the next 15 minutes, and that is he's a big ask, and that will be comfortably the most impressive performance of his career to date. Yeah, it's a good chance to come of age here, and uh, as I said, he's, he's been deeply, deeply impressive this year in the SL8 on his debut, and um, you know, long may it continue. Now Bradley Smith is not an easy driver to keep behind. He has really turned the world of radical racing on his head, the 23-year-old. Radical Club was Cup champion in 2012. Radical SR3 Challenge champion in 2013. Will he be Radical European Masters champion in 2014? He moves up to third place around the outside of Tom Jordan. Super move that for Bradley Smith. The challenge that he's got, though, is that Tristan Vidas, who leads the standings, leads the race, and will pull further clear in the championship. Yeah, on raw pace at the moment, Bradley really sort of... At the, at the very head, I think he's the only person that can, that can truly challenge Tristan, and, and there's a, a massive ass there. There's 23 seconds separating the pair on the last lap, so... Yeah, I know. But barring something going very wrong for Tristan Vidas, I struggle to see that coming down in the next 40 minutes. But second place is certainly on the cards here for Bradley Smith, not least because Christian Tronengard is currently trying to negotiate James Abbott. James, though, is busy having his own battle with Rustam Akinoizov, and therefore is going to be in a hurry to allow Christian Kronengard through. Kronengard sprints past the SR3 now. There you see the deficit to Bradley Smith. Smith 2.3 seconds back as they went over the line. And, and now we're starting to get a great example of, of what we were talking about earlier in the race, where you've drivers out of position for in the pit stops, and they're now having to unlap themselves. Um, through the traffic, the, the varying pace as well, and, and the, the different performance characteristics of the, the SR3 and the SR8. So, um, through the central section of the lap, the, the SR3 with its uh, almost perfect 50-50 weight distribution and, and slightly lighter weight is a is a real match and, and can very definitely cover a lot of ground and, and sort of takes the the big sweeping corners very very quickly. But then once you get round to the, the start and finish of the lap and the long straight, obviously the SR8 has legs there. If you ever come to watch a radical race in person, and, and by all means you really should, because it's a very friendly palette, the drivers will be more than happy to talk to you about their, their machinery. Just go out to, to a mid-speed corner and watch the braking distance of the SR3s. It, it's quite something, because you think, she break there, she break there, she break there. Now he's on the brakes, and there's the corner a metre later. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And the, and the, the, the braking specification, the, 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 you know, the huge 280 millimetre Four piston brakes, and, you know, huge, you know, on all four corners. So um, yeah, these cars can can generate up to sort of 1.8 g in deacceleration, two and a half g lateral grip. The, the forces on the body are, are sort of mind bending. It is it is a real assault on on your senses on a on a high speed lap. So Tristan Vidas, that last lap was a one minute 47.3, which compares almost exactly to Bradley Smith's preceding lap. We're still waiting as we follow Tristan Vidas. 
through turn two for the battle for second and third to come across the start of the finish line. Here it is, Christian Collingard, 23 seconds back. And that time Bradley Smith lost out because he was still uh, trying to find a way past James Abbott, which I think he's done now in two to one. So the track chase is well and truly on. And this is going to really be the fight to watch for in these last 11 and a half minutes. Whether or not Christian Collingard can withstand the challenge from Bradley Smith, they're very shortly going to be coming out of the first sector and that will give us an indication on this lap as to whom has the pace. Collingard though, looking very bounced. He offers us up a 38.1 versus a 37.8 from Bradley Smith. So he was three tenths of a second quicker through the first third of the lap and that rate of capture will get him onto terms with Collingard with a couple of laps to play with. Yes, yeah, I mean, the, the, the last lap actually Christian was able to pull up a, a, pull out a very, very legal advantage, but um, Bradley obviously having now cleared that traffic, he's got plenty of, of space and, and nothing but uh, his, uh, his side set full of Kronegard. Coming towards the conclusion of the second sector of the lap, quite nicely here at the Hungara. The three sectors look quite equal thirds, but they're not that far off. And Bradley Smith, another tenth of a second quicker. You can see the gap now comes down to just fractionally over two seconds. And one of the things I really love about radical racing is that they're not unlike the three races, the three qualifying sessions, and you get very excited about those tiny margins that make the big difference. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, 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 because because everybody's running you know, spe a standard specification, the cars are very, very, very closely matched. So really it's all about the, uh, the individual driver's performance and ability. You know, all the engines are sealed. Um, there's a, a fairly um, tightly controlled range of gear ratios and, uh, and, and specification in terms of wings, dampers, etc. So um, it's very much down to driver ability and, um, and strategy. Well, that last lap, then Bradley Smith in totality was nine tenths of a second up on Christian Cronengard. That is potentially quite significant as that was nine tenths of a second exactly. Now, can he maintain that rate of capture? Yes, he can. Two tenths quicker through the first sector. But the challenge that he's got is another couple of tenths of seconds. He will be into that turn with an air behind Christian Krollengard. And then it becomes a whole different technique. Yeah, it's one thing altogether to uh, to, to claim, you know, to close on somebody and to get onto the tail. But passing them when you're, you're being bombarded by the hot, turbulent air is, is a different thing altogether. Um, particularly on a circuit like this that's, that's quite narrow. And, and the other thing that you can't necessarily get from the pictures here is there's an enormous difference in, in gradient and height from the top and the bottom of the circuit. So the the next challenge for them is that they've got Joseph Collar, there he is, who is going to be caught either towards the tail end of this lap, but more importantly during the middle of the next lap. And let, let's hope that Colin God doesn't get hot under the collar here and go for a rash manoeuvre because it we have seen during this lap exactly as you, you predicted, Will, is that the SR8 have to run behind the SR3s, really, except for the start and finish straight. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, through the, the sort of the lower part of the circuit, where you've got numerous medium and, and low, long sweeping corners, um, the SR3 sort of has the legs really because it's such a nimble car; it can change direction very efficiently. Um, and of course, the SR3s will have, um, because of their, their lighter weight, will have maintained their tyres as well. So. Um, then, you know, that's another factor to consider in these closer stages, of course, is that the SR3s are going to be much more economical on the tyres, and that's going to come into play um, uh, certainly over the last three or four laps. I think. And what was really noticeable then was Bradley Smith came into turn one as he moved out of the direct line, but down the side of straight, out of the direct line behind Christian Collingard, which suggests he is concerned about the temperature of his car, his brakes, his tyres, maybe the engine as well in that turbulent air. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Colour acknowledged those those blue flags nice and early and got out of the way for Bradley to make a clean pass as well. So it's um, status quo maintained into the next lap. If the Rugby Masters Championship was given for the best livery, Joseph Collar would have be a five times straight champion. I absolutely love the, the way that car is presented. Well, he, he's not the only one in the the, the, uh, the Czech Championship. There is a, uh, a Central and Eastern European Championship and there are a number of other um, fairly 
classic liveries, I would say. Um, this is a group of them almost outdoing each other. Um, one of the cars modelled on the, the famous BMW art car um, with some multicoloured stripes around it, a very, very distinctive car in the paddock. So, um, yeah, and it, you know, and it's, it's something that's encouraged by the, by the factory to, you know, drivers to personalise their car, make it their own. Um, you know, these, these ultimately it's a it's a, a great lifestyle. It's not just about racing; it's about everything else that goes with it. Uh, and, and I think that, that that is one of the reasons why these rad radical cars are, are up there in terms of the most successful purpose-built racing cars in terms of the, the volume sold and the volume raced each weekend. Yeah, if you take it for example, the the SR3, which is, is Radical's most successful model, um, it's been in production since 2001 with over 900 units sold. So, um, and that's that's not a number you you get to the rest of the cars easy to drive, cost effective and, and crucially good fun. And also, be, because in, in an era where motorsport has, has struggled through the, these tough financial times, that uh, you, you put a pin anywhere on the map, there is more than likely a radical championship in that country or that region. Yes, and <laughs> in, indeed, on right on the other side of the world at this, this very moment, um, there's a, a, a new championship, a, a new series launching uh, in the Caribbean so yeah there's there's very few corners of the earth like pretty much every single continent apart from Antarctica um, you'll find a radical racing pretty much every weekend. Well, that championship needs on site television commentary. I'll say that right now. Yes yeah although obviously we've been we've been blessed with fantastic weather this weekend I, uh, I, don't, I don't think we can be complaining about the weather here at the moment. We're in. Certainly can't and with that we're going to be treated to an excellent finish of the race as well because the fight for second and third is really closing up. Just four tenths of a second now between Christian Cronengard and Bradley Smith. Tristan Vidas has absolutely checked out. He he leads the way comfortably. Likewise, Tom Jordan is now the best part of 10 seconds behind this fight. But Bradley Smith driving exactly as he needs to. He's pulling out all the stops to get as close to the tail of Cronengard as he can, coming out of the final turn onto the long start and finish straight. Yes, and Vidas is getting a comfort, comfortable buffer, of course, as Cronengard's having to defend. So, um, yeah, this is going to be a really thrilling finish with, with just four and a half minutes to go. Is Smith close enough to challenge? He certainly thinks he is, but ducks back in behind Christian Cronengard at the last moment. Maybe hopes to force the error from Cronengard, who does it still wide through turn one. So is it going to be the element of surprise into turn two from Bradley Smith on Christian Cronengard? No, again, Smith just makes himself as wide as he can in Cronengard's mirrors, really trying to hassle as they then swoop downhill into the section of the circuit overlooked by the, the water park before they then begin the long climb back up to the pits complex. Yeah, Smith will just be biding his time here. Uh, he's possibly eased off just a little bit just to, to bring those tyre temps down so that um, come the, the, next, the next lap as he crosses the, uh, the start finish straight, he can really attack into that first corner. That seems to be a, a favourite overtaking spot of his. So, uh, yeah, indeed, you can see again now he's just building out the pace again, the pressure just to get within a sniffing distance. He, he can probably read the serial number on the exhaust of Cronenguard's car by now. So is it going to be a challenge into turn one? Or is he going to catch Christian Cronenguard by surprise somewhere else on the circuit? Maybe, actually coming out here of turns 12 and 13, sprint towards turn 14, you, you can challenge. Brief look there, just I think I think that was more than anything, just to, to again, just place, place the pressure on Cronenguard, add a, you know, a, bit, a bit of psychology being uh, being used there. And it's working because Christian Cronenguard is turning into the corners fractionally earlier than he would like to. Yeah, you can see he's uh, he's sliding the rear of the car a little bit more than, than Bradley, and all the while, obviously, if, you, if you're going sideways, you're not going forward as much. So we are on to lap 26 of the race. At the pace they're running at, they've got time for this one and one more, maybe actually two more, given that Tristan Vidas is 24 seconds up the road. As Strong Grant slides wide coming out of turn one, this is potentially the opening for Smith. On towards second corner, Cronengard to the inside, Smith to the outside, side by side. Cronengard just plants the car to the inside of the track, then the middle of the road, swooping downhill. But Smith sees the opening, jits through, has the door shut on him at the last moment. Keeps his foot in though and tries to regain the momentum. Yeah, Grone is going to make him work very, very hard for this place, isn't he? Um, left him no option but to go around the outside of, uh, of turn three there. Here's another look at it then. Smith to the in inside and Cronengard said, you can have the curb, you can have half a width of the asphalt and that'll do you. 
but immediately Bradley Smith gets back onto terms. You can see he's got the pace. As Christian Tronagar got the defensive driving technique to withstand the pressure. Well, he's only going to have one more chance to do that. Um, just coming up and around now. Yeah, this will be their last lap as, as we uh, tick under the uh, 1 minute 50 mark. So. Last lap of the race, then about to start when Tristan Vidas crosses the line. And Bradley Smith certainly knows everything there is to know about the, the tail of Christian Cronengard's car because he's examined it from very close quarters for the last two or three laps. And despite that scare there, it doesn't seem to have affected his pace one bit at all. So will he go for the lunge into turn one? Or will he try and upset the Cronengard and think about it more for turns two and three? None of that is of any concern whatsoever for Tristan Vidas because this victory further extend his championship lead. He will of course, be picking up that pit handicap for tomorrow's race. Yes, yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, uh, we've seen a huge number of different podium finishes this year, not only in this championship, the SR3 Challenge as well. So um, it, it's proven to, to really mix up the order and, and, uh, and produce a huge number of different podium finishes. And, and consequently, the, the points are, are enormously clear. Here we are at sort of halfway through the, through the series and there's just six points in it. So Tristan Vidas negotiates this final lap of the race is what is going on with the fight for second and third place and as far as we can tell from our timing screen it is still very very close for the Estonian driver though Tristan Vidas he has done the gentleman set here he has got pole position will be after a penalty for Bradley Smith he was set fastest lap and he is about to score victory in the speed factory car yeah, the team visibly delighted there with his performance uh, so far this weekend and no doubt that will continue into race two. So around the final turn and Tristan Vidas is about to claim victory in race one here at the Hungaro Ring in the Radical European Masters. He has perfectly managed the race and he crosses the line with some 25 seconds to spare on the rest of the field. Here is the fight then for second and third and it's still Christian Trollengard ahead of Bradley Smith. They're coming up to the tail of Alvaro Fontes, who is going to, alongside Tony Ford, score victory in the Supersport class. So Fontes and Ford win the Supersport class, second place in the race overall, going to Christian Trollengard, third place for Bradley Smith. It's a smiling Chris Hyman, who is most likely going to be classified sixth. It's Tristan Vidas. Receives the applause of the marshals as he heads around back to part firm mate and the rostrum so Tom John Alex Capadia home in fourth fifth has gone to Yat Bartles and then sixth for Alex Mortimer and Chris Hyman just ahead of Constantine Calco and Jesus Fuster thumbs up from Tristan Vidas and why not but it's a thoroughly enjoyable race and throughout the field and almost for the entirety of proceedings there were some great battles Yes, yeah, and just, just looking a little bit further down, of course, in the, the Super Sport battle as well, which is, you know, another real sort of hotbed and close, close competition. Um, the Spanish racer Alvaro Fontes taking the flag there just ahead of, uh, of James Abbott and, uh, and the Czech driver Jozef Collar. Yeah, and, uh, and James Abbott actually taking second in the class quite, quite late on then. So let's have a look then at the classification in a couple of seconds' time. As Vidas continues his trip back to Park Fermi. So Vidas wins it 24.4 seconds to advance. Jeff Christian Cronengard, third place, Bradley Smith, fourth, Tom Jordan, Alex Pardia, fifth, Yat Barton, sixth, Alex Mortimer, a birthday boy, Chris Hyman, seventh place, Constantin Calco and Hazel's first. So Alvaro Fontes and Tony Ford finish their 11th with the Super Sport class from James and Phil Abbott. And then Joseph Collar, it is, who completes the Super Sport rostrum. But looking ahead to tomorrow's race, we, we've had three very quick cars here that, that didn't feature Terence Woodward and Ross Kaiser in trouble. The same for Marco Cianchetti. Let's hope that he can get that car repaired overnight because that took a pretty hefty hit into the barrier. And of course, James Littlejohn, who didn't even make it as far as the first turn. Yes, yeah, I think they uh, obviously they'll be looking to avenge 
a, uh, a, a non-finish today. And uh, James, James Little John has, has been chomping at the bit all weekend. Um, it's you know, both in testing and, and qualifying. So, uh, yeah, they're going to be a real threat tomorrow. Uh, Bradley Smith, of course, starting from pole tomorrow with, uh, with Tristan lining up alongside in second. And uh, who knows what could happen. But, but I, I, likewise, I don't think Tom Jordan and Alex Depardieu will be overwhelmingly disappointed to have finished off the podium and therefore scrubbing out any uh, accumulated pit pit time for tomorrow's race. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think I think Tom should be uh, should be very pleased with his, his result today. Those those lap times are you know are very very good for for a driver with relatively little experience in the SR in the SR8. So um, you know he, he's done a, a great job in in really hot conditions. So Tristan Vidas waved into Park Ferme, eh? which is leading to a scramble that we could see from our country box of the uh, Steve Factory Racing Team to, to go and greet our winner. So the Radical European Masters there, second race will, will be tomorrow. Of course, it will be live streamed, so do make sure that you join us. And uh, it's been great to see so many people who, who have uh, either watched live or subsequently watched the races that we had from the Nürburgring back in May. So the marshals do a little bit of sweeping of the circuit, but as ever, the, the race largely clean, very little, if anything, in the way of avoidable contact. I'm not sure about his golf handicap. <laughs> no, the the Hungarian curling team at the next Winter Olympics I think needs a little bit of work, doesn't it? And possibly the football team too. <laughs> Wouldn't want, don't even want to go there. Anyway, we shouldn't, we shouldn't go there, given that our World Cup lasts about five days. Tristan gives the uh, the thumbs up there uh, and looks looks pretty calm and, uh, and collected considering he just spent 50 minutes in a in a 160 mile an hour racing car. It, yeah, he looks like he's barely broken sweat. Um, and I, I, again, the, the point you make throughout the race, I think, is perfectly evidenced there by Tristan V. Dash. You work on that fitness, you spend the time in the gym, it really pays dividends on track. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can you can maintain that same. Um, yeah, not only the pace, but also the clarity in terms of making decisions as we watch the restart here. Um, and and that, that fracas at the, the front of the field. Which put James Little John out of the race. He also triggered an early safety car as the, the order got somewhat shuffled through. Frank fronted opening couple of turns. Chris Hunt was probably the driver who lost out most from that. And then Costa to make progress early on. Overcooked him. And the gas rotating down the order. That's Capaldia. to squeeze past the full guard eventually making the move stick and look around Capaglia to pull clear the end of the towards the mid-race pit stops. John Gandar was another driver who just overstepped the limits and unfortunately losing the engine with that spin. Gandar out of the race. Terence Woodward and Jamie Constable had a thoroughly enjoyable scrap as Marco Cencetti was fortunate to walk away from that big impact of the time when he trying to chase down leader Tristan Vidas. Well, after the pit stops, Colin Guard quickly dispensed with Alex Mortimer. Mortimer, though, likewise, able to sneak through to the inside of Mike Cantillon. Route to sixth place. Route battle over the one for second and third between Bradley Smith and Christian Colin Guard, and that was as close as Smith got to the second step of the rostrum. So it was a victory for Tristan Bidas, but dominantly so, with second place going to Christian Colin Guard, third to Bradley Smith, as the pair of them swapped through the line. They were in pursuit of our Supersport class winners, Tony Ford and Alvaro Fontes. So a thoroughly enjoyable race, and one which the local and sizable crowd here at the Hungara Ring have enjoyed. And certainly off track all day, that the paddock has been a buzz with fans, lots of them taking the opportunity to, uh, to go and speak to the radical drivers, have a closer look at, at the cars, and... Uh, Certainly a very successful trip over here to the Hungara Rink for the Radical European Masters Championship. So the drivers very shortly to be announced up onto the rostrum. It's always nice for, for the drivers will to, to win at a Grand Prix circuit. There's something extra special, I think, because every driver, no matter how old they are, still thinks they could make it to Formula One. And, and an F1 rostrum and an international motor, motorsport event is, is almost the next best thing.
it in. <laughs> so Bradley Smith waving for the cameras. Tristan Ridas is there and ready. Christian Krollengard hasn't quite made it yet to the rostrum. The Hungara ring track Thank is... Uh, you are watching and thinking, well, maybe we should pay a visit. It, it really is a very easy circuit to get to. It's only about 10 miles or so drive from, from Budapest Airport. It's only a 25 minute drive from the centre of Budapest. And the, the track, a very friendly, very intimate venue that offers good spectating. There are two drivers who did not want to be spectating. James Littlejohn to your left in the black polo shirt in the blue t-shirt is Tony Wells' co-driver. They will be back tomorrow for another crack at the whip and hopefully a slightly longer race. As first of all, we are going to have the super sport podium. So that's Joseph Collar in third position. Looks very, very happy with that. Second step of the rostrum, James and Phil Abbott. Congratulations to the pair of them. And then our winners in the Supersport class, that was Tony Fawn and Alvaro Fontes. So, so the, the Super Sport podium celebrates here at the Hungara Ring. Thank you very much for your company this afternoon and for joining us for the first race of the weekend. We will be back tomorrow with all of the action from race two. But as the trophies are presented here on the rostrum, it is time for Will Brown and myself, Ben Evans, to say goodbye from the Hungara Ring. A Egyesült Királyságból. Szóval srácok. Congratulations. És kétszer megjár meg a kategória győzteseinek Spanyolországból. Hallára Fontes és John Ferré. Körmától vegyünk ide a serleget, a puszit. Please stand together for the official photos. Nagyszerű. Okay. 